Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome along to this Smart Cities World webinar brought to you today in association with Ubiquia. I'm Luke Antonio. I'm the senior editor here at Smart Cities World. I will be your host for the next hour or so. So as you may well have guessed from the name of today's webinar, which you see on screen, we are going to be speaking about streetlight infrastructure and its role in public safety, something that is increasingly important for city and law enforcement agencies to utilize in developing safer city streets and more livable more transparent cities and communities and well with urban space at a bit of a premium to, to say the least it is really going to be critical to use the existing space and infrastructure in order to push the smart city and safe city agenda forwards um, and really that's something that today's sponsors Ubiquia know all about creating technology that leverages existing infrastructure to make cities smarter uh, safer and, and better connected as well so today we're going to have a look at what that means in practice uh, and we have three, thankfully, very willing participants joining us today to do that. I have a quick introduction to each of them before we kick off uh, and also into what they'll be covering to, on today's agenda. So first off, we'll be hearing from Ben Gardner, who is president of Northeast Group, uh, which is a smart infrastructure market intelligence firm based in Washington, D.C. Um, ben has been covering smart city and smart utility, utility sectors for more than 15 years, and he'll kick us off shortly uh, with some presentations on the role of streetlight infrastructure in public safety. Um, after which, we'll hear from Todd Rydell, Director of Video Security and Access Control for State and Local Government at Motorola Solutions. Um, Todd is responsible for business development and customer engagement activities for Motorola so Solutions, Video Security and Access Control Solutions for State and Local Government entities, and has extensive experience in helping organizations use advanced tech to solve pressing problems, which I'm sure resonates with a lot of our audience today. Uh, and prior to that, Todd led all global strategic partnership and key customer acquisition efforts at a global lighting controls provider. And Todd is going to be looking uh, today for us at smart video technologies themselves. Um, and then last but not least, we'll also hear from Joe Friedman, who is Director of Product Management at Ubiquia, our sponsors today. Uh, and he's bringing over 20 years of experience uh, at Motorola, including leadership roles in engineering, product management and sales. Um, Joe also has a uh, Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering from the University of Miami and is also a certified law enforcement officer in the state of Florida. So some really fantastic practical experience in this in this space as well. Uh, and Joe will be covering off smart video solutions applied in public safety for us towards the end of today's presentation. Um, so welcome to all of our speakers. Welcome to our audience. It's Fantastic to have you all with us. Um, and as usual, um, before we kick off, a reminder to those of you watching live, um, before we get underway, that we'd love to hear from you. So use the chat box, drop your questions in for all of our speakers using that Q&A box at the bottom of the Zoom platform, and we'll get to as many as we can before time is up today. Um, that is all from me you'll probably be glad to know so without further ado we'll kick off and i will hand over to ben it's over to you first of all thank you let me just make sure i've got my uh screen control here um great so uh thank you uh to smart cities world for organizing this webinar um, and giving us the opportunity to share uh, some ideas with the group today on how street lighting infrastructure can be an enabler um, of public safety. Thank you as well uh, to my fellow panelists for joining me uh, and joining us. I'm really looking forward uh, to the discussion today. So I've got kind of five slides or main points I'd like to go through today. Um, first, we're gonna look at the disconcerting rise in um, violent crime since the start of the pandemic. Um, after this, we're gonna provide a bit of background on the street lighting infrastructure um, and then in slides three and four, we're going to kind of tie these two ideas together, um, specifically noting how this street lighting infrastructure uh, can play a role in improving public safety. And lastly, um, we want to highlight the very important role of proactive community engagement with all of this. 
Um, so I can just get to the next slide. Let me see here. Um, some reason my slide's not changing here, guys. There we go. Now we're starting. Great, thank you. Um, so this is kind of my depressing slide. Um, what had been a very positive trend uh, over the past couple of decades um, suddenly reversed with the onset of the pandemic. Um, the news headlines you see there uh, to, the, to the right side of the slide tell the story. Um, and then the bar chart um, on the left side there kind of provides the quantitative uh, backing to these headlines. Um, if you kind of stretch the time series of this chart a bit longer, uh, you'd see a steadily declining rate of homicides really over the past two decades. Um, this chart is a five-year view, um, and you can see the kind of tail end of this long decline. So shown here from the years 2017 to 2019. But then um, there's an inflection point and a big jump. And of course, this was after uh, the onset of the pandemic. Homicides and violent crime rose sharply, uh, especially across US cities. Um, we see here that between 2019 and 2020, um, across a sample of 10 major cities, homicides rose by, uh, by over 37%. Uh, if you look at some individual cities, New Orleans uh, up 64%, uh, Chicago, 53% up, both uh, Boston and New York up 47% and kind of on down the list. All cities uh, have been uh, struggling with this explosive growth in homicides. Um, and as we've seen from recent events, unfortunately, school shootings continue uh, to happen time and time again. Um, and, you know, these, these warning statistics are not lost on residents. Uh, we have growing concerns that uh, the public safety crisis is out of control uh, and we risk a flight from cities, mayors, uh, police chiefs, other city stakeholders. Uh, they know that they need to get the situation under control um, and they're looking for novel solutions. Um, and one solution uh, may lie in an unexpected place. Um, and that is uh, in a once boring uh, and largely overlooked piece of municipal infrastructure, uh, the humble uh, streetlight. Uh, so let me just get to my next slide here. If you could tee up the next slide. Thank you. So on this slide, we're gonna provide a, a bit of background um, on the installed base of streetlights um, and the growing market for, uh, for smart streetlights. So there are more than 400 million uh, streetlights here in the United States. If we kind of uh, zoom out a bit to the rest of the world, this number balloons to over 300 million. Um, and the street lighting market, which, you know, let's be honest, uh, in the past has been an incredibly boring market. Um, it's been quietly undergoing uh, a transformation. And it's all of a sudden a, a very dynamic market uh, that is unleashing all sorts of interesting um, smart cities, use cases and benefits. So the first step uh, was the evolution from legacy uh, high pressure sodium or HPS streetlights to more energy efficient and longer lasting LEDs. Um, this alone was a, a huge step forward, uh, but then the transformation continued uh, with smart streetlights that were networked, allowing for things like um, dimming capability and individual control um, and outage notifications and other enhancements. Um, if you could just jump back to the previous slide, please. Um, other and other enhancements. Um, so now, you know, we're seeing um, kind of the next stage of this transformation with expanded smart city capabilities uh, beyond simple streetlight control. Um, so if we look here on the slide, the map of the left, uh, we can see the, the robust level of project activity for smart street lighting. Um, in the US, we've got uh, electric utilities who own some of the street lights. We've got cities who own some of them. Um, and oftentimes mixed ownership structure, where in one city, uh, it will be both the utility and the municipality owning a portion of the streetlights. Um, many of the early smart streetlight projects were pioneered by large investor-owned utilities. So we've got you know, Florida Power and Light's a good example, Georgia Power and others. Um, and now we've got a number of cities uh, that are following suit with these projects. Chicago uh, actually just wrapped up a huge project uh, and we've got a number of others in the pipeline, such as uh, Philadelphia, Washington, D.C., and others. Now, if we kind of look out over the next uh, decade or so, we, we, we have growing numbers of smart streetlights being deployed. 
Um, globally, the, the figure will quadruple from 20 million you see there currently to about 80 million. Um, here in the US, uh, we also will see a quadrupling from about 4 million smart streetlights to 16 million smart streetlights. Um, and many of these will uh, feature advanced functionality. Uh, if we could go to the next slide, please. Great, so on this slide, um, we're gonna kind of bring together the first two slides I presented. So the public safety um, issue with the street lighting market. Um, we can see on the graphic um, at the bottom, this transformation that I, that I briefly spoke about on the previous slide. So from LED conversions uh, to basic connected lighting to advanced smart city use cases, including those that improve public safety. So now we've got some positive solutions uh, to, the, to the public safety challenges that cities have been struggling with recently. Uh, use cases such as video monitoring, gunshot detection, and others focus on public safety uh, can be another tool in the toolbox of city stakeholders as they seek to improve um, you know, safety in our cities. Um, there are a diversity of use cases available that leverage the street lighting infrastructure. Um, in some cases, you know, we've seen cities kind of taking a piecemeal approach uh, to smart city sensors and hanging them one at a time on street light poles. Um, and th this is really suboptimal um, for, for a number of reasons. You know, first, you're rolling a truck uh, and paying a crew each time that you install a different sensor. Um, so installation costs obviously add up over time. Um, second, the aesthetics really suffer. Uh, many of you've probably seen uh, a streetlight pole with all sorts of junk hanging off of it. Uh, and and it isn't, it's not pretty. You know, some, some have been calling them sort of, you know, Frankenstein meets the streetlight pole or, or a Franken pole. And I'm actually on the, when we get, do get to the next slide later, I'll show you a picture of that. Um, third, you know, hardware costs end up being significantly more when you take this piecemeal approach. If you use an integrated solution, you can really cut your hardware costs. Um, and lastly, you know, you also avoid um, multiple vendors, multiple uh, potential failure points, all of the disconnects between these, this, uh, these various vendors with this piecemeal approach. Um, so if we you know, take kind of a few of the, the, the popular applications, uh, we estimate uh, that you can cut in half your hardware costs by employing um, an integrated solution. And you, you'll kind of see that at the graphic, uh, on the graphic at the top. And obviously you save uh, all of the installation costs from doing it multiple times. Okay, so my next slide is gonna show this, this Franken pole that I've talked about. Uh, so that's the picture on the left there, all kinds of junk hanging off of it. Uh, look at the picture on the right, that's an integrated solution, nice and clean, barely visible from, um, from the street view. Um, and obviously, you know, we, we want our streetscapes to be um, aesthetically pleasing in our cities. Um, and then if we just head to my, to my last slide here. Um, so our last slide, uh, I'd like to cover something that unfortunately um, is often overlooked with public safety initiatives, um, and that is proactive community engagement. Um, at its core, you know, community engagement is all about building trust. Um, and this is especially true uh, for applications that leverage video monitoring. Uh, there is a fear out there uh, that these do have the potential to be Orwellian in nature. Um, and this is where community engagement really becomes so important. Uh, because when you do actually poll residents, the vast majority um, actually support video monitoring to, to improve um, public safety. Two such polls you'll see here on the slide showed 78% um, and 71% respectively supported video uh, to improve public safety. Um, and then just a few quick uh, practical recommendations uh, that cities can adopt um, to increase their chances for success. Uh, so we've got five here. The first is um, creation of a privacy policy. And this, you know, this really is a first critical um, step. Um, time and time again, we've heard um, city stakeholders say, that you're destined to failure with any technology initiative if you don't have a concrete written privacy policy. Um, this privacy policy should not be created in a vacuum, uh, but rather in a collaborative uh, way with the community. Um, it should articulate um, the values and the principles of the community. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, people want to be safe, uh, but they also want protections on their privacy. Um, and one last important point is that this policy should be written 
in clear, plain um, language. It should avoid uh, being bogged down with legalese or you know, technical jargon. Um, the second is just a, a proactive community engagement and outreach. And you know, ideally, if you're creating your privacy policy in collaboration with a community, you're already well on your way with a step. Um, again, this is all about building community trust. So it's about taking the additional step of involving community members in policies and initiatives to ensure buy-in rather than you know, informing them of these policies after the fact and after they've already been made. Um, third point here is just aligning your technology choices with your policies. So once the privacy policy has been formulated, technology uh, selected must conform to this policy. So, you know, fortunately, there are things such as privacy by design and things like that that ensure technologies meet privacy requirements. Um, there are also, you know, other things such as, you know, processing data at the edge um, and only sending back anonymous metadata to centralized storage. Uh, this helps protect personally identifiable information. Um, and, you know, there are numerous other ways to ensure uh, that, that your, your technology kind of protects, protects privacy. Um, the fourth point here is around transparency uh, with regards to areas that are monitored. Another best practice is just clearly articulating um, or identifying, I should say, areas that are monitored. Um, we've seen cities kind of install um, signage that includes like a QR code uh, that links directly to the privacy policy, maybe an FAQ section on the website. So any resident walking through that, that monitored area and who has a smartphone, um, you know, they can click on the QR code and they're, they're aware of everything. They know, you know what data is being collected, how it's being used, who has access to it, how it is protected, um, you know, just full, full transparency. Um, and, and lastly is just the importance of equity. Um, the public safety initiative sure ensure, should ensure equity um, and not discriminate, you know, profile or exploit any vulnerable populations. Uh, for example, uh, you know, cities may choose to avoid cameras near places of worship, um, select cultural institutions, other locations uh, that may have sensitivities around religion, um, ethnicity, race, sexual orientation, etc. cetera. Um, this is kind of a basic step required to, to ensure that you're building uh, community trust. Um, and that's just kind of a quick primer um, on some of the, the practical steps that cities can take um, to ensuring that their technology you know, and or uh, public safety um, initiatives are successful. And, and now I'll hand it back to, uh, to the group and the other presenters. I believe Todd uh, will be going next. Thank you so much. Well, thanks, Ben. Uh, we'll spend the next portion of, uh, of the webinar focusing on an overview of uh, smart video technologies, including AI-based analytics that are essentially designed to help you keep your city residents, your employees, and your visitors safe, and certainly your city assets uh, secure. Uh, moving left to right, we've got uh, the components of a smart city, video, a smart video solution uh, naturally include cameras. And shown is the Ubiquia UB Hub mounted to a street light via the NEMA receptacle. And the UB Hub provides power, uh, processing, um, backhaul, and um, along with metering and street light control. Also shown is an Avigilon dual head camera mounted below in one integrated, uh, easy to install unit. And there are a variety of cameras and form factors and resolutions that are available to handle most every use case. Next up is analytics. Essentially, analytics are the technologies that let the camera do the work for us. Uh, analytics can be located at the edge, they can be or located at the server level. And AI analytics never blink, they never take a break, then they serve as extra set of eyes and ears on the scene for us. Third, storage. And now storage can be located on premise or in the cloud or hybrid. So you can have a, a hybrid solution of on premise and uh, in the cloud, as well as storage located on the camera. And then finally, uh, the last component is a video management system or VMS. And the VMS is the software that defines the user experience and, and the way that you interact with live and recorded video how you configure cameras, how you configure users and user rights, access, et cetera. 
In total, those are the four major components of a smart video system. Now, in addition, some other items to look for include things like NDAA compliance in the US for National Defense Authorization Act compliance and Department of Homeland Security safety certification to ensure that uh, no banned third-party components are included in this, in this stream of technology, which would you know, basically uh, bring a halt to your federal or your state grants. And also uh, avoid reputational risk about having those banned components. And finally, ONVIF compliance. So ONVIF, O-N-V-I-F, is an open network video interface form. It's a form and it's a protocol to ensure operability across the entire uh, value stream here from, so that different cameras can talk to different VMSs and, and vice versa. And those of you that are familiar with the street lighting controls industry have a very similar initiative under TALC in terms of ensuring compatibility across different, different manufacturers. So let's start with the analytics. So when you position a camera, power it up and point it at a scene, uh, the analytics kick in automatically. And what they do is they begin to classify objects. And when we're talking about objects, we're really only talking about people and vehicles. And in addition to classifying objects, we're also understanding the pace and the heartbeat and, an, and the normal activity that appears in that scene. And the AI essentially at the camera level is learning about the scene or the field of view that it's pointed at. And you'll see that camera in action by these blue and red bounding boxes. So for example, when you see a blue or a red bounding box, that's the camera's way of telling you that I've got this object, I've classified it as a person or a vehicle, and I've added it that classification to the video stream. In addition to these major classifications, we're also adding subclassifications. So on, on persons, we're adding additional metadata. Is the person an adult or juvenile? Is it a male or female? What's their hair color? What's their upper body clothing color? And what's their lower body clothing color? And on vehicles, in addition to color, we're adding subclassifications like, is it a car? Is it a bus? Is it a truck? Is it a motorcycle or a bicycle? So looking at that in action, here's a, here's a transit platform, Newark, New Jersey. We've got some bounding boxes around individuals. Now these are normally turned off, but I, we turn these on so you can see the bounding, these bounding boxes in action. But you'll notice that these bounding boxes appear around individuals and also in the center screen, uh, center of the screen around that gentleman's bicycle. So this is the camera's way of telling us it's classified this, it's captured it, classified it as an object, either a person or a vehicle, and added that subclassification. And if you hover over a bounding box, it'll tell you what it's classified at. So hovering over the bicycle classifies that and shows you that's been classified as a bicycle. Now, this is a fundamental analytic. The classification of objects that move through a field of view for the camera is a fundamental building block analytic. So what do you do with it? Well, if we know what, if we know that vehicles are passing through and persons are passing through the field of view, we can set up alerts, we can set up triggers that will alert us to certain events that we might be looking for. Again, this goes back to the concept of letting the camera do the work. So on the far right of the screen, you'll notice I've got a DPW yard in the camera's field of view, and I've got a green shaded area that you as the user create. And that green shaded area is a polygon that you basically push and pull on the various anchors and create this green shaded polygon or this virtual fence on a particular area inside the camera's field of view. And once you've got that shaded area created or that virtual fence created, you can set up alerts, you can set up triggers to alert you on certain events that happen within that green shaded or within that virtual fence. So things like an object leaving the area or an object uh, loitering in the area. I, again, an object is a person or a vehicle or an object breaking through in one direction or another into that virtual fence. All of those can be rules that you set up as the user to alert you on certain activity that you wanna be alerted on. And those alerts can be set for different times of the day, different days of the week, et cetera. Uh, and they can be generated as text or emails out to the appropriate personnel who can then log in and see what's actually going on based on that alert. Because again, we want the camera to do the work for us. 
And we know that we're not going to be watching these videos unless we're in a real-time crime center that, that Phil will talk about. We're not watching this video 24-7. So let's let the camera, let's let the analytics do the work for us. So DPWRs are a classic example of, of using these kinds of alerts. We also see this alert uh, in a lot for municipalities that have uh, other assets like pools and boat ramps and playgrounds, et cetera, where perhaps the pool might be open from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. And they'll set up an alert that after the pool closes, any object, any person that enters the screen area should trigger an alert. They want to prevent the midnight swim. Right? They, they've got the folks hop on the fence and they, uh, they enjoy a, a summertime party in the pool. And that creates a huge liability for the municipality, for the city. And this is one way to alert you on that kind of event. Other kinds of use cases would be uh, you know, monitoring loading dock areas for loitering for a car or a truck that, that spends too long in that loading dock area, or bicycle lane obstructions, or monitoring traffic counts or people counts at a particular intersection. Or in fact, we've got one um, a Department of Motor Vehicles that monitors the lobby. And basically when the wait time or the number of folks in that lobby get above a certain limit, they know to add more staff. All right, so that's fundamentally a building block analytic. I wanna to go to a second analytic. And that analytic is, is one we call unusual motion detection. And unusual motion detection, again, is, is after the camera has learned the scene, has learned the heartbeat, has learned the pace of activity at that location in its field of view, the camera will alert you on motion or activity that it finds unusual, that it's never seen before. So for example, I've got a crowd gathered on the street corner. Camera's never seen that before. Camera's gonna send an alert. I've got a person two o'clock in the morning in a car doing donuts in the baseball field in center field. Camera's never seen that before, send an alert. Now you as the user get to modify that. So you can add your own expertise to the algorithm so that for example, if the camera's alerting you on every Thursday night at midnight during the summer, because there's a crowd of people on the, on the football, field or in the baseball or basketball court, um, you can override that, say, no, that's the Midnight Madness, Madness tournament. It's every Thursday night. We're going to ignore that kind of an alert. But just as the previous analytic is very good at alerting us on activities and events that we're looking for, someone's in the DPW yard, someone's in the pool, someone's where they shouldn't be, or there's a person or car that, that's where it should not be. Unusual motion detection is very good at alerting us on, on events that we may not necessarily be looking for. And it's the camera that's basically alerting us and telling us that's something that I find unusual. Unusual motion detection here, uh, I've taken a little snapshot. Um, what you're looking at is it's three o'clock in the morning. I'm looking out from a window across a river. There's a, there's a train bridge that spans the river. You'll see some bounding boxes not on the locomotive, but on the second and third cars of this particular train. And you see some debris falling off the train into the river below, and this train's on fire. And the camera is basically raising its hand and saying, this is not something I normally see. I'm gonna send an alert. So again, it's those analytics that are kicking in for us. The third analytic is unusual activity detection. Unusual activity detection is a very close cousin of unusual motion detection, but unusual activity detection really focuses on the speed of objects, i.e. persons or vehicles, the directions of those objects that they're taking, and the location. And those three factors are what it's essentially looking for, speed, direction, and location. So again, on the far right, I've got an alert because the camera has picked up this gentleman standing on top of the vending machine. And again, the camera says, that's not a typical, typical location that I normally find a person. So I'm gonna raise my hand and send an alert out to the users. And again, those alerts can be text or email messages, et cetera. All right, the last, last analytical, the last fundamental analytic I wanna talk about uh, is something that we call appearance search technology. Now remember, during the classification of objects, when we're identifying, is it a person, is it a vehicle, we're also adding additional metadata to the video stream in real time. So on a person's, is an adult, is it a child, is it a male, is it a female, what's the color of their hair, what's the color of their upper body clothing, 
what's the color of their lower body clothing, and other subclassifications on vehicles. So this data, this metadata, allows us then to quickly search for those characteristics. So it's turning video into searchable data. Now, this is different from facial recognition. Facial recognition starts with a face. Find me this face. We offer facial recognition, but appearance search is not facial recognition. But facial rec recognition says, here's a face, I've loaded this face, I've curated this face, I've got an expiration date on this face, go find me this face throughout the video. Appearance search doesn't start with a face. Appearance search starts with the, with the question, go find me a person or go find me a vehicle that looks like this. So again, we're turning people and we're turning vehicles into searchable, into searchable data. Good example of this might be silver alerts, amber alerts throughout your city. Uh, this is a museum. I've, got some, I've took, taken a snapshot of, uh, of some of the cameras here at the uh, Children's Museum. We've got a report of a lost child. I can go up to the search bar and enter that descriptive information of who I'm looking for. All right, so I'm gonna search for a person. I'm gonna search for a male or female person. Hair color might be brown, might be blonde. Age is juvenile. I'll come back and I'll search on, on clothing color. And I can search for the upper body clothing color as blue. And I don't know the lower body clothing color, so I'll leave that blank. Enter that information, hit the search bar, hit the search button, and the hits that the algorithm thinks belong for you to view are then shown. Now you, again, as the user, can go in here and start clicking on those particular images uh, where you want to further refine the search. But we found our lost child. It's up here on the third, the top row, third one from the left, this little guy in the center. So again, it's very, very easy to find or to search video data, data when looking for a vehicle or, or a person of interest. Now you'll notice that the algorithm does return outliers. There are images that it's picked up and displayed to you as a user, which may not fit or are slightly off from the description that we entered. All right, I've got females instead of I'm looking for males. So I'm looking for, for adolescents or child versus an adult. And essentially, we're not giving total control over to the algorithm. We want to put the power of the technology into the hands of the users who then can select those particular images and those particular hits that they want to further refine. So again, the algorithm is allowing us to do this search very, very quickly, but then we're, we're relieving control of that further refinement of that selection in the hands of the user. Now, I want to close on some of the things that, uh, that Ben touched on. We talked about the, uh, the strategies to ensure um, transparency, to ensure that community engagement. And I want to talk a little bit more about the tactics involved in that. We work a lot with municipalities and cities in terms of rolling out their smart video and will often uh, be asked to uh, present to the town board, present to the town meeting, also help with their FAQs. And these are what's you know, essentially very tactical, uh, very practical uh, pieces of information that are either on their Facebook page or on the city's website, et cetera. And they go, and they go to asking or answering some very fundamental questions. Why are we doing this? Why are we putting smart video up? And obviously, it, it directly impacts the mission of, of pr protecting the city residents and employees and visitors as well as city assets. Where are we doing this? Ben mentioned signage. So you know, where are these cameras going up? How are we notifying people that there are video cameras in use? How is this How are the data being stored? How's the video being stored? How long is it being stored? Where is it being stored? Are we storing it for three days, seven days, 30 days, 150 days, a year, et cetera? That's all up to you. Who has access to it? Who in the city, what departments, uh, what level of folks will have access to looking at recorded video or even live video? How is it financed? How are we paying for it? Whose budget is it coming from? Is this an operating expense? Is it a capital expense? Are there grants involved? Are there recurring fees? And obviously there are more, more questions. And again, that whole community engagement that Ben talked about, that whole transparency to ensure the balance of the city's mission to keep everyone and, and all properties safe, as well as ensure privacy is very critical. And the key question, one of the key questions that we get are facial recognition. Are we using facial recognition? How are we using it, et cetera. 
So that's a very, very quick overview. Uh, we touched on the components of the, of the smart video. We touched on some of the analytics that form the basis for, for smart video and, and how those analytics, analytics can help us do more with less and let the camera do the work. And we closed with uh, some very tactical approaches to keeping folks well aware of what is actually going on in, as you implement smart video uh, throughout the city. And what I'd like to do now, I'd like to turn it over to Joe who is going to talk about some very, very compelling uses of smart video for public safety applications. Hey, thanks, Tom. Yeah, actually, Luke, if you wouldn't mind driving this one for me, then uh, yeah, we could just go right to the next slide. So the question was, uh, how are the ethical use of artificial intelligence and integrated video, video and data analytics changing the way law enforcement addresses public safety? And, uh, you know, it's a great question. I think, first off, I've seen some major behavioral impacts just with the proliferation of video in general. Um, you know, I see video as a great accountability tool, and it really works both ways. So that's police be behaving badly and citizens behaving badly as well. And in general, I, I think as we all, you know, in our own experience, right? People are just less likely to behave badly if they know they're on camera. Um, and there's various studies showing this. There was one with the Chicago Police Department it was published 2021 that found there was roughly 30% less complaints against police and a 40% reduction in officers' use of force once they implemented body cameras. So, you know, I think we can all acknowledge it's a challenging time to be in law enforcement and really the accountability on both sides of the equation is the first step in improving that relationship. Now, Operationally, many agencies are inserting a real-time crime center, often called uh, RTCC, you'll probably hear me refer to it as that, um, and the associated analyst positions into what was the traditional public safety ecosystem flow. And you can see I've actually got those highlighted in blue there with the intel analyst and the crime analyst. Those positions didn't really exist before, um, and they are providing real-time intelligence for faster and more efficient mobilization of available resources, as well as situational awareness to the field. Um, after an incident, they're providing actionable intelligence, which can lead to quicker apprehensions and overall crime reduction. And we'll dig into that more on the next slide. Um, Todd touched on this, but really, if we consider the use of video and artificial intelligence, it's, it's a topic that's always linked with discussions regarding ethics and bias and policing. Uh, ben touched on it as well. So in my personal experience, there's less bias than people might think. So here in Florida, everybody's riding around with super dark window tint. So honestly, when I do a traffic stop, I have no idea who I'm pulling over. Um, but in general, video and particular license plate recognition or LPR, as you often hear it referred to, I think, it, you know, in, in my experience, it helps reduce racial profiling. Um, it's something that's totally automated. It's based solely on license plates that are expired, uh, vehicles that have been reported as stolen or involved in suspicious activity. So in that way, it helps remove that profiling element from policing. And that's not to say that bias doesn't or can't exist in any of these systems. Um, you know, there's several studies and articles discussing bias and facial recognition and also the disproportionate targeting, say, of lower income areas. Um, so I guess, you know, the point is, as with any emerging technology, there's going to be some challenges there. Uh, it's a tool and it'll continue to evolve. And to Ben's point, you know, it's our responsibility to ensure it evolves and is used both transparently and responsibly. Uh, next slide, please, Luke. All right. So how can implementing an integrated, flexible platform change the economics of law enforcement? I think, you know, all agencies right now are facing personnel, budget and resource limitations, and they're being challenged to use their existing resources more effectively. So in order to do more with less, agencies need to leverage, I guess, what we call the force multipliers, right? And advancements in video quality, uh, video analytics, make it possible to remotely monitor areas like, like Todd was showing and receive alerts and then view and react in real time, um, as well as provide that situational awareness once you're finally looking at what alerted to the responding officer. So for example, you know, if, if they tell me, hey, there's a man with a scoped rifle in the Northeast corner of the target, uh, target parking lot, as opposed to the call coming in as just a 13P, which is a suspicious person, am I gonna respond differently? You know, absolutely, a more tactical approach, make sure I've got my body armor on and try not obviously to be in the line of sight as I'm approaching. So, um, and then as we move to after incident, the ability to search hours or days of video for particular person or vehicle in seconds instead of hours, 
Um, obviously, you know, you can't understate the benefit in time sensitive situations. You consider the example of we're looking for a lost child and we just enter those search parameters like Todd showed. So it's a child in a red shirt. And, you know, maybe I can use that video to locate the child or at least get a lead, you know, of the direction of travel or last known location. So we're not spending all sorts of time and resources just getting a massive boots on the ground search, you know, and starting from really ground zero there. Okay. And um, then finally, you know, these solutions are often integrated with a digital evidence management platform. Um, so we can archive that video for use, whether it's a trial in training or to look for trends, right? Something that's starting to come in with some of these predictive algorithms to help deter future crimes. Uh, probably reminding you guys of that Minority Report uh, movie, which, you know, we think about it now, it was 10, 12 years ago, but they were really onto something there. Um, so anyway, from a resource safety and operational efficiency standpoint, the results here of video and AI are really tangible. Next slide. Okay, so what can you learn from people using video and data analytics to secure public spaces and solve crimes faster? Well, for me, you know, from personal experience, I would say there's just no substitute for good video surveillance and license plate recognition. And, you know, I put the good, the word good in there because I'm not talking about that old school grainy convenience store video. You know, they had some ancient DVR, the cameras were pointed, you know, all crazy directions and whatever. And believe me, I've seen plenty of that and had to retrieve plenty of it and it was totally useless. Um, but to give an example of the good, I would say the, the first bad domestic violence incident I went on, um, it was quite sad actually, the husband had broken his wife's jaw in two places and she was bleeding severely from an injury to the back of her head and uh, in and out of consciousness and I really thought she was going to die. Um, her husband, it turned out, had been the one that called it in. He said she fell, um, but I think really he was scared that, you know, he overdid it and he, and he killed her, and, you know, that she was going to die as well. So he fled. Um, in his car, but we had the tag. We were able to bolo out the tag and he was picked up later that day just north in Pompano Beach by Broward Sheriff's Office after an LPR hit. So, you know, I have several other personal examples, but just one example of really the incredible power of uh, video and smart video and analytics. Um, but there's also plenty of statistics to back it up. So, for example, in 2018, there was a study funded by the NIJ, which is the National Institute of Justice, it was in partnership with the Milwaukee Police Department, where they installed a combination of panoramic PTZ uh, and uh, LPR cameras, 17 intersections through the city uh, over a four year project. And then what they did was they looked at crimes just within 500 feet of the intersections and actually saw roughly a 15% increase in those crimes. So I don't think anybody expected that, but um, the thinking there was that, well, those crimes probably would have gone unreported uh, otherwise. But really more significantly, what they saw was a 13% improvement in overall clearance rate and a staggering 80% increase in the clearance of violent crimes just by having uh, that video that they could refer to on the scene. So. And just to be fair, there were other crime initiatives uh, going on in the city at the time, crime reduction initiatives, so you, you can completely attribute it all to that, but still very statistically significant. Um, and there's several other examples of video successes in the public safety space, including some we had with a pilot project in San Diego. Uh, there's a project we're just kicking off in Ontario. I know some of those guys are on the call, so welcome and thank you. Um, project Greenlight in Detroit and, and various other private, uh, public-private partnerships, which we'll talk more about on the next slide. So um, we've touched a couple of times today on the concept of a real-time crime center, RTCC. Uh, in 2019, Broward Sheriff's Office established an RTCC, and that center has direct access to video surveillance of nearly 10,000 cameras in more than 260 public schools and administrative buildings across the county. Uh, it's in partnership with Avigilon, something Todd's company was involved with from the very start. Uh, Broward Sheriff's Office, or PSO as we call them, they're also pioneers in this area of public-private partnerships, so much so that you can actually go on their website and download the forms, and if you meet certain criteria, such as backhaul and video quality um, uh, and protocol, you can get signed right up. And this allows for the surveillance fees from local businesses and even potentially participating households from sources, sources such as Ring to feed directly into their center. Um, so just for example, an integrator friend of mine uh, completely outfitted the Ferrari dealership here in Broward to feed into the center. Because you know, here in Florida, there's nothing more important than uh, keeping your Ferrari safe. Um, but in reality, we actually have a shocking number of vehicle thefts right off dealer lots, uh, both new and customer cars. And uh, I gotta tell you, those are some really awkward conversations with customers um, that are reporting the theft of their car that was in for service. Um, really awkward. Um, so anyway, yeah, I also have a couple of good ring stories if we have time, but uh, um, this whole public private partnership basically opens uh, a lot of possibilities, right? For the monitoring of other spaces that might otherwise not be monitored. So we're talking hospitals, 
mall parking lots, car dealerships. And uh, just to hit on the car dealership thing again, um, down here, we've got a spike in the catalytic converter thefts. People are just taking a sawzall and, and, and just zip zip cutting the catalytic converter right off and selling them afterwards. So, you know, um, this kind of video surveillance at, at parking lots, you know, something these parking lots all have in common is light poles. And, you know, now that we have a way to overcome the challenge of backhaul and power at the poles, uh, the opportunities in this space are very powerful. Obviously, the quicker law enforcement's on the scene, the more intel we have about the suspects, the greater our chances of apprehension. So, next slide. All right, so a topic that uh, unfortunately, once again, is top of mind right now is school safety, right? Um, Florida, and particularly South Florida, where I work and live, has been challenged to improve school safety in the wake of that Parkland tragedy in 2018. And I can't speak for the rest of the country, but I do know that our police training has a specific focus on active shooter training and drills. Uh, we, of course, train to run right at the threat instead of systematically clearing the building like we would for an otherwise barricaded suspect. Schools are locked down during school hours with a secured single point of entry. Every school has at least one school resource officer and many opt to hire additional officers and or private security in addition. Um, they've instituted a color-coded threat response plan. Teachers and students all regularly train to run, hide, and fight in that order. And um, I've you know, responded to several code reds myself, which all thankfully turned out to be nothing. And without giving too much of the tactics away, I will say that the kids were all pretty effectively barricaded and hiding to the extent where they didn't even want to open the door for us in full uniform, which is good and sad at the same time. Um, Florida has also passed various legislation directly targeting school safety, including raising the minimum age to purchase long guns, such as an AR-15 to 21. Now, I think I just read yesterday that the mayor of New York City enacted exactly the same legislation. Um, you know, so so finally, I, I feel like, you know, Florida has been a little bit of a model, unfortunately, because, you know, we experienced some of this first, but, you know, some of the other states and stuff are starting to come around. Um, and like I said, I think we've determined a lot of school shooters are under 21. So just just raising that age can be helpful there, uh, along with better background checks in a three day waiting period. Those are things again that Florida has done. We've also enacted what's called the red flag law. And I read that uh, I believe New York did a similar sort of thing, which gives law enforcement a tool called the RPO, which stands for Risk Protection Order, basically allows for the seizure of firearms from individuals in cases where law enforcement can articulate a credible threat. Um, seizure of firearms, as everybody knows, is really a prickly topic due to that Second Amendment. And uh, so this is really a potentially impactful tool. Something else down here called Alyssa's Law. It was named after Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, high school shooting victim Alyssa Alhadef. Um, it requires public elementary and secondary schools to be equipped with and I'm gonna, silent panic alarms that are directly linked to law enforcement. Um, so this can come in several forms, but it's frequently an app that all students and staff have on their cell phones. And it goes hand in hand, of course, with a campaign encouraging students, if you see something, say something. Um, another thing down here, many of the schools are deploying the advanced video surveillance systems with the analytics like Todd discussed and, uh, you know, basically to be able to detect and alert on, on these things like unusual motion, uh, you know, is just an incredible, um, you know, and, and to have that be routed directly to law enforcement centers for an immediate response, uh, you know, just provides an incredible advantage. So, you know, this is a horrible topic. I, I, it upsets me to even have to talk about it, but I think some of the things that we've done in Florida, particularly with regard to the legislation and now on the technology side could really be a model for the rest of the country. Obviously, like I said, the early alerting, uh, direct link to law enforcement, real-time crime center, um, could just help shape critical moments off any sort of tactical response, um, make sure the right resources are responding and that they're directed to the right place. So to summarize, you know, it's, it's my opinion that the effectiveness and efficiency of video and data analytics and AI from a resource standpoint, uh, not to mention the evidentiary and accountability benefits are really pretty indisputable. Um, obviously having enough cameras to effectively blanket an area such as a school campus and then site-wide connectivity via Wi-Fi and LTE are critical to the effectiveness of these solutions. And uh, we firmly believe that leveraging the existing streetlight infrastructure can play a critical role here. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Joe. Um, and thanks, uh, thanks to Ben and Todd as well. And like you say, it is a it's really timely to be having this discussion now, um, given given recent events. And it shows that we're not just talking about technology and technology based solutions here, um, but that the impact that they can have um, can can change lives and change cities truly for for the better. Um, 
thanks to everyone uh, who sent in their questions. We, we do have 10 minutes left to, to be able to get through some of those, um, which we'll, I mean, we'll, we'll jump in straight away. And Joe, there's, uh, there's, not, there's no rest for the wicked. We're coming straight back to you uh, for the first one. Um, so one of the questions that, that we want to ask is, um, what do you see as the biggest opportunity in the connectivity and public safety space? As we as we move forwards, we've heard you know a lot about how the technology be can can be used and and how effective that can be. But what do you think some of those next steps might look like? Well, what I think is next, you know, and I'd really like to see done better is uh, really just sort of data sharing between agencies. So so once we've identified somebody as a possible risk or something like that, you know, for for all the agencies, even locally and nationally, to be able to maybe kind of flag that person and keep a better eye on them. Um, that's definitely one thing. I think the other side of it that I see, you know, I, I talked a little bit about minority report, right? I mean, I think that there, there are opportunities now with all this data, you know, because ultimately it's all data to work up some of these predictive models. And I know some of these, you know, some companies, including Motorola, are looking at predictive algorithms to try and, you know, sort of proactively have the right resources in the right places. And, and to me, you know, that's the future of law enforcement. It's an area that I'm very excited about. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, our, our next question, um, I'm going to come to this one for, for Ben. Um, based on, you know, what you see in the market, what, why, why do you think the penetration rate of smart streetlights isn't higher than it is at the moment? Um, and I suppose as a follow on fr from that, you know, what do you think some of the hurdles are for public authorities in looking to integrate and, and adopt those those technologies? Yeah, that's a good question. I think, and we get this one a lot, I think there's kind of two big reasons why the penetration rate is not higher. Um, I think the first one is just a, a general lack of awareness of the strong benefits of these projects. I think among, especially among city stakeholders and even frankly among some utility stakeholders, there's a lack of knowledge of the business case. Um, and, you know, we've shown ourselves in several studies, these are slam dunk projects with positive benefits to costs. Um, so I think that's a big, and that's really on the industry for, for a better education campaign. Um, the second reason is that a lot of the early street lighting projects focused on LEDs when, when that technology first came out. Um, and so there was, you know, one truck roll that touched each endpoint, but it just did the LED change out. And if they want to then do controls, they need to do another truck roll. So all of a sudden your installation costs have, have ballooned. Um, so so our, our recommendation is, you know, if you have not done LEDs, uh, pause, you know, take a step, think about the benefits of doing smart street lights as well, and just do one truck roll to do, uh, you know, the, the, the integrated solution. Uh, you'll save a lot of installation costs and you'll get a lot more, more benefits. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of, kind of, uh, quick response. Um, I did I have one other question. I saw the, the very first question of the chat was, uh, someone came in and was asking about, um, the cities and they were asking if Chicago was, had the highest rate of homicide growth. So I can hit that one real quick too. Actually, Chicago was second, um, homicides were up 53% in Chicago. Uh, the number one city was, uh, New Orleans, uh, in Louisiana, that was up 64%. Um, and then the uh, kind of tied for third and fourth um, was Boston and New York with 47%. But again, you know, those statistics are depressing. That's why I called it my, my, my depressing slide. Yeah, yeah sure. Was... Yeah, I not not to, obviously not to dwell, but, you know, it's, do, does, do those stats not back up where it might be an easy win to implement technology such as these? Yeah, I mean, I think, like I said, that, you know, city stakeholders, police departments, et cetera, are looking for novel solutions. I think uh, this type of solution is, is one tool in their toolbox. Um, and I think also, you know, hopefully we, we get a bit of a tailwind um, as the pandemic recedes and that we sort of see a normalization as well. So, you know, some technology and also some normalization in our daily lives. Hopefully, yeah, for sure. If we did this webinar in two years, our, our, the stats would, would fall down. Yeah, uh, let's uh, let's try that to this time and see see where see where we are. Um, Todd, I'll uh, I'll come to you next. Um, similar question, really, to the one for Ben. You know, in terms of 
adopting and implementing smart video solutions what what are some of those obstacles really facing municipalities and city governments or public safety agencies um at the moment and you know how how do you see them sort of overcoming those hurdles sure. well they they're really two buckets so you've got a, a funding obstacle right so how are we going to pay for this so where where is that where's the money coming from and there's there's many, you know, there's obviously well, here in the US, there's just a lot of grants that are becoming available for cities to do exactly that, to, to write those grants and receive that funding for, for, their, for their safety, for their security efforts. And then the other obstacle is just, you know, we talked about the balance of privacy and, and mission, right? And, and keeping that very, very transparent. Because if you, if you don't get on the front edge of that conversation and there's a lack of information, you know, we're, we're all the same. It, 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 when presented with the lack of information, we will make stuff up, right? So if we're making stuff up, we're, 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 we're not, you know, we're not being transparent. We're not getting the right information out there. So transparency and balance is absolutely critical. Funding is absolutely critical as well. Knowing where the money is coming from and how, and how you're going to pay for that is, is critical. Yeah, for sure. And I think that is, you know, it feels like something that, may forever be an issue um in in the public realm um but doesn't stop it being any less a legitimate problem sure but you know as as, as ben mentioned earlier in terms of the, the folks who who are supporters of smart video will be out and will be out on location with uh, with the mayor with the city with the city council said it will be taking test shots test shots and more often than not we're asked the question when are we going to get our cameras from the from the residents in the area so it's, you know, the timing is very good. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Joe, um, I think we've got time for, for one more before we wrap up. Um, it's, a, it's a bit of a bit of a technical question, I guess. Um, so in terms of sort of the process of, you know, implementing and integrating cameras into, into streetlight infrastructure. So when cameras are connected to Ubiqui at the top of a streetlight pole, you know how much can they see at that at that height and what is is there any impact i suppose on um implementation in that way as opposed to implementing on for example the, the corner of a building or something like that sure so that's a good question and actually you know todd could probably help jump in here but uh you know so there's cameras that are integrated into the hub and then also there's cameras uh you know via the third party uh third party camera support via the poe port so so really it depends on your application and what you're trying to see i mean certainly an lpr camera or something like that needs to be mounted in a particular way at a particular height and aimed in order to be effective um i guess basically the short answer is that we're flexible right and depending on what it is exactly that you're trying to capture and maybe even the height of your street pole you know it can either be mounted up there directly at the hub like you saw or or potentially down a little lower uh with a particular and specialized camera to capture exactly what it is that you're trying to get yeah that i think that'll be really helpful and um the mention of flexibility is always welcome i think uh it's a really important part of any kind of technology implementation really is that flexibility and being able to to pivot in a way that is going to enable a wider adoption of this sort of technology and many others that are, that are really going to benefit the public um because for cities that's that's got to be top of the agenda um is always pivoting back to what works best for their citizens and communities um well thank you very much um for your time all, all three of you it has, it's been really fantastic to, to have you feature during during the webinar um and thanks for all of your insight during the presentation and and in the q a as well um it's been really interesting i've taken a lot from it i, I mean i i always do but i'm sure the same will apply for our audience here as well um speaking of which if you did submit a question that we couldn't get to then we will look to answer as many as we can after the session wraps up via email um but as i normally do at this stage i i will say i encourage you to to connect with with our panel here uh on linkedin or however else you might go about doing that and um look to keep the conversation going because that's that's how we that's how we learn and that's how we advance smarter safer and, and better connected cities um 
so thanks to thanks to you guys thanks obviously to our sponsor as well ubiquia and to all of you watching either live or or on demand um thank you very much indeed for, for taking the time out um take care and i'm sure we will see you next time thanks a lot thanks everybody